Peace be with you all. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for him and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions and those that follow until the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, everything I had prepared just went out the window because of what Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinawi covered. Not because he took my material, but because there were so many points that he touched on that segue into this discussion of fear. Fear is a very interesting emotion. It can motivate or it can paralyze. It can be productive or it could be destructive depending on who you fear, why you fear, and what you fear. That fear is either praised in the Qur'an or it is looked down upon when it becomes paralyzing and destructive and leads you to nowhere but despair. The last lecture by Sheikh Abu Abad talked a lot about hope. And unless you have that hope to balance you out, there is no way that that fear could possibly be productive because the default of fear is that it is a paralyzing emotion. It needs hope in order for it to be productive. But I want to start off based on a hadith that builds on what was just talked about with Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want you to picture the scene. If there was to be an attack on a city, what usually happens to the most important people that reside in that city? Where do they go? What do they do? I'm actually asking a question, by the way. It's not rhetorical. They hide. When a head of state is present and an attack unfolds, typically speaking, the head of state will be locked down under maximum security and those who are already most vulnerable and poorest will be the greatest at risk because they weren't even important in the first place. And that's another discussion altogether. But too often we only talk about the oppressed when they die, not when they're living. So when we talk about black lives matter, it's not black deaths matter. There's a whole system of black lives matter which is to be discussed before black deaths. But that's aside from the case. Usually the most vulnerable are thrown up there. And the most powerful and the most important, those who are deemed most important, are hid away and tucked away, often by their own commands. I want you to picture the scene in Medina. And this hadith sends shivers down my spine because I always think about it when I think about the quality of fearlessness that we take from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, as he usually did when he would reflect on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described a beautiful quality of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and then a manifestation of that beautiful quality. And there's a pattern there when you study the narrations of Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, that he'll say something beautiful about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it's easy to cast a quality on a person, but then he'll actually give an example of how that quality was lived. So he says, كَانَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ The Prophet ﷺ was the best of people. And in this context, he was also speaking about the way that he was externally. He was the most perfect of people. وَأَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ And the most generous of people. وَأَشْجَعَ النَّاسِ And the most courageous of people. And he recalled this incident that took place where there was some noise outside in the middle of the night in Medina and the people thought that they were under attack. So when Medina is under attack, where do you think the Prophet ﷺ should go? What do you think the protocol should be? Shouldn't everyone surround the house of the Prophet ﷺ and make sure that he's protected? Medina is supposedly under attack and he said, and we came out and we see the Prophet ﷺ riding on his horse, unstrapped to it. So the Prophet ﷺ is not is, is completely unrestrained on this horse 
and he has his sword in his hand and the Prophet ﷺ is riding around to make sure that whatever came would be deterred. And the Prophet ﷺ says to the companions, says to the people of Medina, Lam tura'u, lam tura'u, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Ali radiallahu anhu says that when the battle would become toughest, when it would become hottest, and when we would be utterly exhausted, the people would hide behind the Prophet, peace be upon him, in battle. He was the nearest to the enemy. Al-Bara said that the bravest of us would only be standing next to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was it about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that gave him such courage and such composure in the face of things that would usually cause people absolute fear? And fear is a more comprehensive emotion in the Qur'an. There are different things that you fear. Some people fear death. And you sound radical when you tell people not to fear death. Until you can throw in a Socrates quote which exists or a, a quote from Plato or a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King who said that if you haven't found something worth dying for then you're not really alive. But when the Prophet wasallam says that the nations will gather against you and feast on you at a table and fear, al-wahn, will be placed in your heart. And the companion said, what is al-wahn? The Prophet ﷺ said, حُبَّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةَ الْمَوْتِ To love the world too much and to hate death too much. That doesn't make us a death cult. You can find similar sayings in context to the same effect that if you haven't found something that gives you absolute resolve in the face of things that should, should make you scared, then you need to reconsider what it is that you're living for in the first place. What was it about the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't fear the snares of the people and the stares of the people and the smears of the people? Allah describes that as a legitimate fear in the Qur'an, the fear of being outcast. They're not afraid of the blame of the blamers. We're not worried about being outcasts. What was it about the Prophet ﷺ that when a man grabs his sword and stands on top of him and says, Ya Muhammad, man yamna'uka minni, O Muhammad ﷺ, who will stop me from killing you? That the Prophet ﷺ with full composure and tranquility can say, Allah. Without stuttering, without shaking, Allah. There was something about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was that complete trust in Allah, that nothing was worth fearing but Allah, that no consequence that would be faced for his sake is to, is to be feared either. What's the worst that they could do to you? What's the worst that they could do to you when you're living for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If they kill you, it's shahada, it's martyrdom. Whatever they do to you, if they slander you, then Allah will glorify you and raise you. What's the worst that they could do to you? That's that fearlessness that was in the voice the unquivering voice of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah when he said, what can my enemies do to me? My garden is in my heart. Jannah is in my heart. You can't take it away. They kill me, it's martyrdom. They deport me, then it's a chance to reflect on the signs of Allah. And if they leave me in isolation, then it's a chance to be in seclusion with Allah. There is no fear because there is nothing worth fearing except for him and there is no consequence worth fearing if it is faced because of your determination to do what he commands you to do subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ taught us many lessons in that and I want you to think about this because fear is a natural emotion and it takes time to get over that and for many people they really start to get over that fear when they face things that they realize were not so bad as they were made out to be. When they overcome difficulties in their life, then they're able to conceive of how they would deal with a difficulty of a greater magnitude when they face it in their lives.
So it's not when you're afraid that you're insincere, but sincerity propels you to that fearlessness and to that courage. When we see the izzah, the honor of our modern day Muslim heroes in Al Hajj Malik al Shabazz, Malcolm X, who said very bluntly that he never does or says anything except that he expects the most difficult of circumstances and consequences as a result of it. If you YouTube Muhammad Ali bodyguard, a man who many in America predicted would be assassinated, by the way, and said it was a miracle that he lived to see 40. You could actually go back and read the editorials of people expressing amazement that Muhammad Ali was not assassinated, may Allah have mercy on him, and the man walked around without a bodyguard fearing no one but Allah. In an era where any black man who opened his mouth too much would be assassinated. Muhammad Ali, may Allah have mercy on him, who had the biggest mouth for Allah and for the truth, went untouched. Apartment was set on fire the day that Malcolm was assassinated and it only allowed him to grow in that determination It was meant to shake him, but it only further stabilized him. Where does that come from? What it comes from is not seeing what's around you that is supposed to be causing you fear But stabilizing that which is in the inside and reminding yourself of the one who sent you here with a purpose and the one who truly protects you, and the one who truly rewards you, and the one who truly honors you, what can anyone do to you then? It was the scene in the Battle of Uhud when the Prophet ﷺ was almost killed and he's carried behind the mountain and his enemies call out, Afilqawmi Muhammad, is Muhammad ﷺ amongst you? Is Abu Quhafa, the father of Abu Bakr, amongst you? Is Umar amongst you? And they boast, they boast that this was a day for us, that we have avenged our fallen in Badr. And one of the words that came out of them, or one of the sentences that came out of the mouth of Abu Sufyan that day was, We have Uzza, wala Uzza lakum. We have Uzza, an idol, and you have no Uzza. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell Umar anhu to respond and insult his idol. Because his idol was insignificant. And his words were insignificant. And his intimidation was insignificant. He said, respond and say, Allahu Mawlana wa la Mawla lakum. Allah is our protector and you have no protector. He brought it back to Allah. Because if you have Allah, then nothing else matters. Then no one else can frighten you. Then no one else can scare you. Then no one else can intimidate you. Because you realize that all dignity and honor and protection comes from Him. Take it back to the Prophet Sheikh Muhammad just spoke a little bit about it when he's in the cave. Sheikh Muhammad spoke about the actual protection from the enemies. But think about that. If there was any moment that would absolutely send shivers down your spine, imagine being in the cave that day and you can smell and see your enemies just a few feet away from you, all with their swords ready to pierce your body, all of them waiting for the opportunity to kill you. You've already seen so many of your own killed. You've already seen the torture of Ammar and Sumayya and Khabbab and so many of your family. You've already seen it all. And now this appears to be the end. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu started to fear not for himself but for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him with full composure, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Do not be afraid. Allah is with us. The Prophet ﷺ didn't even mention any of the spider web or the bird's nest or any of the circumstances. No. Why are you afraid? Allah is with us. لا تحزن إن الله معنا. فأنزل الله سكينته عليه. And this is such a beautiful 
effect of the Quran here. Allah specifically says, He casts down tranquility on his heart. And Allah knows best, but, but the scholarly interpretation that his heart is referring to Abu Bakr here. That he cast down tranquility on the heart of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr already had ikhlas. He was already sincere. He was already truthful. But Allah settled his heart and put tranquility. When you have that composure, as you look around you and everything is meant to intimidate you, everything is meant to threaten you, everything is meant to shock you, but on the inside, you're growing that trust in God to where it doesn't even phase you anymore. I'm not going to pretend like I have no fears. And I'm not going to suggest that any one of us has attained the courage of the Prophet ﷺ in this room. Nor will we ever attain the courage of the Prophet ﷺ in this room. But I what I will suggest is this, that the Prophet ﷺ's equation for attaining a sense of courage and not being afraid always circulated around that singular concept of Tawheed, of experiencing monotheism in the heart and settling your heart with Allah. And never overestimating the circumstances or the people or the threats or the things that are said about you. If you haven't found something worth dying for, then you're not really living. If that sounds radical, well, we have a radical fear of Allah and a radical fearlessness of all of these cowards that are trying to intimidate us because of our belief in Allah. Settle yourself on the inside. Allah knows that we have enough courageous examples, that we have enough courageous examples from the Prophet ﷺ and his companions and the righteous who we saw live in our lifetime that we're able to propel through the most difficult of circumstances. Dear brothers and sisters, these are times that are meant to scare you. And I want to end with this, and my time is already up. And actually, I didn't even scratch the surface of what I wanted to do. But I'll say this. The first thing is just recognize that everything around you right now is meant to intimidate you. All of these, all of the news cycles, all of the politicians' words, all of these threats, all of the incidents that are taking place, it's meant to scare you. The greatest way to resist that is to build that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How you do that is by centering Him in your life in times that are not frightening so that you will have Him in times that are frightening. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ taught, that remember Allah in your times of prosperity and Allah will be with you. Be with Allah in your prosperity, Allah will be with you in your adversity. That's not just referring to, I know you always hear that at the fundraiser, that's not just referring to your financial capital or the money that you have. When you have money, be generous and give so that when you don't or when you're in a hard time, Allah will send money to you. Be with Allah in prosperity. Allah will be with you in adversity. Be with Allah in times when you're not afraid and Allah will know you and be with you in times that you are afraid. But center Allah in your life. And as a community, we need to center Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again in our discourse and remind ourselves that Allah Mawlana wala mawla lahum. Allah is our protector and they have no protector. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.